All right, as you can see, I'm in a blacksmith shop right here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about Damascus steel because this is one of those topics where there's plenty of misconceptions. People have all kinds of ideas about the mythical powers that it has and all of that. So why not ask the expert? If you can't tell by the apron, blacksmith. <laughs> Not the hands or anything else. No, right? no. <laughs> right, it's, they're, they're just minor cues. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm Adam Kellogg. I am from Bifrost Forge. And I'm Ben Wong, and I'm from Stuart Mountain Forge. And today we're going to be talking about Damascus steel. Mm -hmm. More accurately called pattern welded steel. Pattern welded steel is a process by which you take two or more different layers of steel, laminate them together, and then apply heat and pressure and fold them back upon oneself until they become a homogenous material. The Vikings and the Celts were amongst the greatest exponents of it, but most cultures developed the process. People in the Crusades used to call the blades that they saw Damascus steel because of the patterns in them and because, well, they saw them in Damascus. But that was a different material called Woot steel now. The reason why pattern welded steel was so important over the years was the fact that way back when we didn't have crucible steel, and crucible steel was the process by which you could create a very clean steel. We needed higher fires than we had. So now what we are left with is a problem of inferior steel because it has full of inclusion, slag, inconsistent carbon mixtures. And the process of pattern welding helps you to distribute that more evenly among different carbon steels, very much like kneading dough. Kneading dough and bread will help mix the flour so you don't have a spot and cause it to break apart. Yeah. Also, not just removing the impurities you get with a, uh, you know, not as developed smelting process, but also um, being able to counteract the natural inconsistencies in the chemical compositions of the various ores and that you'd find in different regions. Some ores would just naturally give you steel with a certain kind of working compositions, while others would be a bit different. Pattern welding or Damascus or any sort of lamination is all about, you know, kind of melding out all of the different properties to be able to make them suitable for your application. Precisely. The other thing that was worth mentioning is that in the rare occasion where they managed to find a really good clean steel, there often wasn't that much of it. So one way by which you could help spread it out, say you were going to make two or three really good striking tools, but you needed more, you could add a lower carbon steel to the mix and basically do the same thing as adding water to a good soup and get more out of it that way. So. The misconception that the more layers you have, the better it is, doesn't really apply anymore today. Not anymore. It, it used to be no. like that. Today we have steels with such a perfect composition. It's chemically tested. Um, if we're making a homogenous product, where especially if we're doing a thorough heat treat, where everything is hardened, everything is tempered, the benefits of lots of layers are, are lost. For the most part, there are some laminating processes where we do get some benefits mm -hmm. by keeping, a, let's say, a backer as of softer steel or tougher steel with a, a, an edge that has a higher carbon content. Whereas if we made it all of the high carbon contact, it would have no impact resistance and it would fail under those circumstances. So there are, there are, there are times where doing laminated uh, sections or even a combination of uh, pattern welding and then laminating uh, will yield a better result. But uh, generally, uh, pattern welding in Damascus today is uh, about looks mm -hmm. and uh, the aesthetics that you get from uh, adding that to, you know, your favorite knife form. Very a good much example so. of the practical application of combining that would be a Dane axe, where you have a harder cutting edge and a softer main body that is mm -hmm. more resistant or tougher, more resistant to damage that way. And of course, the katana does the same thing. The thing about the Japanese katana is that it was made using multiple different carbon content steels. Their process is incredibly involved, but the big thing about that is they used different types of steel for different sections of the blade in order to yield the best results. So they'd use the highest carbon cutting, highest carbon steel for the cutting edge, but use progressively softer steels to reinforce it and to give it the springiness it needed in addition to doing the differential heat treat. This also harkens back to what we were saying that uh, st to get a nice pure steel with a higher carbon content, it's a lot harder mm -hmm. and it's a lot, uh, the ores to do that with traditionally are quite rarer. So this also comes to help bring that material, make it last longer, get more mm -hmm. product out of the limited ores and the limited uh, resources you have available. So in the same process with the axes or with the katana, we use either a lower carbon wrought iron body 
which could take the toughness but is easier to make and you can be made out of most of the iron, iron ore you could find. And then we just sandwich in, they put it in or laminate them even more sections just to fill out uh, for the application. Quite often you just see when, when it's a cheaper knife, for example, you just see steel Damascus which tells you absolutely nothing, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Because it's only relevant if you actually know which steels were combined into it, right? Very much so. Yeah. And on the rare occasion, you'll see something that's advertised as an etched pattern, and it is just that, etched, where they'll put a negative image on it and occasionally just acid etch it, and it may not necessarily even be Damascus. Thankfully, they don't usually call it that. What unquote printed Damascus exactly. patterns, right? So how are those done? Those are done by creating a negative image layer, basically uh, much like a lot of the car, car guys will have vi vinyl decals that they'll put on, paint, peel it away, same idea, except in this case you can have that uh, paint you put on be something that's gonna resist corrosion, and then you dip it in the acid. And then from there, you just have the unaffected layer followed by the affected layer. And that also reminds me of another thing that may be worth pointing out. Um, if somebody wants to figure out if it's genuine Damascus steel, if they just you know, gr polish the surface, then it might still disappear, right? So they may think it's not Damascus, even though it is. If somebody wants to figure out if it's genuine Damascus, they need to uh, grind off the top layer and then etch it, correct? That would be a good yeah, way of doing it. Mm -hmm. way to do it. Just whenever you want to purchase any Damascus blade, it's always nice to know which alloys that are being used mm -hmm. in the welding. It'll give you an exp it also what pattern, because it'll give you an idea of how the blade will perform. Um, part of what you know, makes Damascus you know, a bit tricky sometimes for um, deciding the application or what pattern or what steels we use for what, what the actual knife or axe is going to be used for. So if we know the steels, then we can know the cutting performance rather than claims. Whereas if, if you want to buy a Damascus knife or axe and you don't know what it's actually made from, it's just Damascus, it could be anything. It could be mild steel in 1045 or it could be 5160 in 1070, you don't know. But Damascus doesn't automatically mean it's going to be made of good steels. You always want to check with a reputable maker that they will know, they will have their known materials, they will know their pattern, and they will know the finished product will be consistent. And if it doesn't say what steel it is, then buyer beware. A bit buyer beware. Mm -hmm. It could be all kinds of... But, you know, always inquire sometimes. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just not written there and they know it. But, you know, if, uh, if they can't tell you, that's... That's a bit of a yeah, red that's, flag there. That's a red flag for sure. So before we get to the actual process of you know, how it's made. Um, can you just explain what the difference is that uh, the number of layers make? How many, if you have a large number of layers compared to a small number? The higher number of layers will determine respectively how many times you've either folded the piece or cut and stacked it, but the big thing is how much of a contrast you're gonna get. Uh, you can have a really beautiful pattern that is you know, 2,000 layers that you can barely see because depending upon the size of the application, you may not be able to differentiate the uh, lines of black and silver, whereas a you know, lower layer count, uh, Bill of Damascus, say a 60 layer, will have very wide bands that are quite easy to see. So it depends upon what you're after. And especially if you're using any of the contrasting steels, some with nickel or chromium in it, uh, if you go with a lower carbon, a lower layer amount, well then you'll have even greater contrast and you'll be able to see it from much farther away. Whereas if you made it with a, a higher layer count, you won't be able to tell as much the difference because everything is just so packed together. Mm -hmm. And in historical times when they did have less pure steels, then it would make sense to use more layers to spread Very out impurities so. more. Also, if you're if you're using traditionally smelted materials, you have this silica that's staying in, and that wants to be forged out at forge welding temperature. As you're squeezing and forging the material, those, those impurities get removed. So the more layers you, you're able to weld through together, well, the less silica you're gonna have if you're, you're using more those ores. So ideally, if, you, if you're using a traditional, if you have a traditional blade, if you don't see the pattern, or barely see it, is it good? Okay, let's take a look at some of your work here. Oh, and by the way, there will be links in the video description to their websites and all of that, so definitely check that out. So, so here's one in plain steel. steel for comparison. Yeah, I've done, I have this design, which I'm selling. I have 
some I make in carbon steel, or I make it with various Damascus patterns, or I can do it with the forged stainless steels. Now this design is a bit uh, taken from Germanic or Viking style knives with integral, integral uh, metal handles. And I've made it just a bit rounded, a bit nice and balanced in the hand, but uh, still, still a recess so you can come down all the way with it. Yeah, just a Damascus pattern. This one was a carbon Damascus with a random ladder pattern. Yeah, you can see it really, the pattern really pops, you know, depending on it. If you twist and turn it in the light, you can see it and I've very kept, well. Uh, I've kept through polishing even the handle, although the, the pattern runs the other way, so it's less pronounced, but uh, it is still visible. So how many layers was that? Uh, 124. 124, so okay. So you'll see the difference between 124 and uh, 200 and 384, 384 yeah. with some of Adam's pieces. Yes. So you can really see, or at least eyeball the, the vague number of, of layers by looking at that. You see mm -hmm. this, is, this is a very pronounced pattern, pretty large. And if we look at this one right here in comparison, that's a very nice contrast. So it's a lot more layers. Now that's the main difference between going to a higher layer count and you can often tell where it's been forged quite heavily by how compacted the layers are. So for example, in this section you can see very tight grains. You can see the swirls which are occasionally spill over from where the blade was folded uh, during the initial forging process of the Damascus. And this one here is 384 layers of 1084 and 15 and 20. It's also interesting to see the difference over here. You've got the swirls and then there at the edge, it's more you know, sort of lines, mm -hmm. wavy lines. So there are lots of different visual effects that you can create with Damascus. Very much so. You can have all kinds of patterns, including star patterns and mm -hmm. a wide variety. It just depends upon if you're going to leave the steel to do what it wants to, or if you're going to do either a surface or material manipulation, because you can change so much about it. This one is a lowly 104 layer pattern, but again, again you can see how it tightens up where it's been forged more heavily. It's one of the nice things about being able to forge pieces. You can actually uh, manipulate the grain. Sometimes you'll want to keep the same pattern, so you have to do a lot of grinding work, but like Benoit, I enjoy doing a lot of forge work. Right, when you hold it like that, it shows up really well with mm -hmm. the light. Yeah, that's, that's the main appeal of Damascus nowadays. It, is, it really is very pretty. Yeah. And of course, also, what I have to say is seeing the process in action really gives you a, a different appreciation for it. You know, seeing it like this and also seeing all the work that goes into it, it does give it more appeal, do you have to say. You, you have to appreciate the craftsmanship that's in it. So that is pretty awesome. And down here, it's quite a different effect. Yeah, a couple blades that uh, came out of the quench. Both of these are pattern welded or Damascus. They're both made from 144 layers of 51, 60, and 15, and 20. This one follows a classical blacksmith or Viking knife, which, much like the one Benoit makes, is inspired from a lot of the finds found in Denmark and all throughout Scandinavia during the migration period and slightly before. Now, the neat thing about these kind of blades is that when you are working them, you occasionally see the layers show up through the oxidization. And likewise, when you quench a blade, you can occasionally see the pattern. It's very subtle here, but you can actually, if I get the right light, see a little bit of the rippling along the edge here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely shows up right here. Yeah. And it can also be blackened after it's, it's all treated, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a number of processes by which you can make the steel look much more sharp. So there are plenty of options for styling them. Mm -hmm. The sheer volume of choices on how to work Damascus is nearly endless. I mean, I know of two or three different, uh, sorry, two or three dozen different patterns, and 
there are hundreds upon hundreds of variation, especially if you add any kind of uh, artistic nature to it. Because what you can do is you can create what's referred to as mosaic Damascus, and y if you're clever, you can actually make a signature out of it. I haven't <laughs> tackled that yet, but it's on the horizon. And the, with the use of powder, uh, powdered metal as well, we can reproduce any, any image you want in a whole bar of Damascus or in just different sections and weld it into a billet later on. And with the, with the variety of techniques and methods, you can, you can play with Damascus, you can produce anything. It's, it's a near limit. You, you, could, you could do this trade your entire life and live to 90 and not get them all. <laughs> when you can get half, I think. No. And that's part of the joy of it. Yeah. How wear resistant is the edge surface? As, well? um, as it is right now, it's not terribly wear resistant. As a rule, when it comes to the Damascus steel surfaces, they're not terribly wear resistant. They're as wear resistant as, I would say, a satin polish is. Say, most of us have a pocket knife of one kind or other, and if, as we know, if we end up hitting against anything hard, it gets a nice scratch across it. Likewise, you'll find that these will scratch over time, but the advantage to powder melted steel is that it goes more than just skin deep. So you yeah. can always bring it back. 